when I shall box or, or, or show up in the fights, him and his father, who was very close to his father, just passed away not too long ago, God bless him, but he always brought Russell to boxing matches. And Russell Peters loved boxing. This guy told me a story I didn't know. I went out to visit him. I just interviewed him. I have a new television show coming up. By the way, I'm over 60 years old, but dreams have no timeline on them. I will continue to dream. As long as I'm living, I'm going to keep giving. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to keep believing. I don't care how old you are. Nobody can put a timeline time on your dreams but you. My new TV show is going to go coast to coast like butter toast, man. And this is one of the guys that I want to stay at his house. My wife was with me and she repeated that. She said, that's where George Clooney's lives. My wife said, that's where I'm going. I said, not today, baby. <laughs> he shared with me when he first appeared at Jack Jack's the first time, he was booed right off the stage. Now that would have stopped a lot of me. He tried to be funny. This was his dream. I want to be a comedian. He was funny. I'll get in trouble in class. His father had said he was always joking around at home. He could have walked away, he didn't. He just sort of critiqued us, saw what he did wrong. He went back again, had a standing ovation. He hasn't stopped since. That was his dream to become a comedian. Very strong self-confidence in himself. Stay focused. What do you want in life? Stay on track. He set goals in that area. He, some of the clubs he talked in, you know, I, I did uh, two or three corporate gigs. When he actually appeared, I got him for 500 bucks. And I'm talking as little, I'm talking five years ago. 500 bucks. Police, they had the police association, that big banquet hall they had over in York, I believe. We had a couple of gigs there, and he came out and spoke. Brought in a couple of bus posters. They loved him, he was funny. Look at him today. That house he lives in, I gotta tell you something. It's in the San Fernando Valley. And, uh, his bedroom was as big as my whole house. He has four garages, and he offered me the keys to a Lamborghini. That's what he's like. He's very generous. While we were there, a kid that he hangs with out of LA was, was doing a club in the West End, and they weren't getting the kind of publicity they needed, so they weren't selling out. This was three days before Russell was getting ready to go on his European tour. You know what he did? He said, I'll come down, spread the word. I went down with him two nights later. That place was jammed packed. And Russell did this for nothing because he's a friend. How many people know who Russell is? I'll see him. He's from Russell's come a long way from Brampton. Come up and, uh, is this Brampton? Yeah. This is up in this area, so you got something to write about. <laughs> I, I, strong support system. Get a good support system around you. Never mind having people around you that are putting you down. Man, I'll tell you, in my book here, I talk about a guy named T.C. He was my best buddy. I met him at church, Sunday school, when we were six years old. I, I, I watched the doorway, stole the money from the collection plate. <laughs> we were bad kids back then. My father was a pastor. T.C., when I went back to school, T.C. was the first to come down upon me. She made me too old for all that S.H. That's what he said. They didn't believe in me. You need people around you that believe in you and want to support what you're doing. A lot of people get uptight if you come back to school. That means you've got to stop partying, maybe doing things that you did before. So they get a little, they get a little upset to think you're putting them down or you're not good enough for them. Anymore. They'll try to run a game on you if you let them. Not everybody, but a lot of them will. Don't let them run a game on you. You've got to take care of number one, you. you got to stay focused. Strong support. Last year, he's among the Forbes list of 10 top earning comedians. He was at number nine. I mean, number number two. He used to be my only man. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy stuff. There's a little guy that I, I respect. Remember Jersey Boys? It was all done on him. It was all about Frankie Valley, who I've had the honor of interviewing a couple of times. He doesn't even allow interviews. He gave me two interviews, and we hung out together. They had a great time. He asked me if I was an FBI agent. He was surprised I didn't so much about it. First time I heard Frankie Valley, I'm going way back in the day. I was ironing a pair of pants in Detroit. I was about 18 years old. Didn't break the to a dance. And back then, man, 
You had to have the crease in your pants, baby. You know what I mean? And I'm sorry, I had the, the, the pants on the ironing board, and I had my, my wet cloth on, them and the, uh, you know, and then, because you got to get the crease, because I used to step, you got to step, you know, back in the day. You dressed, you didn't dress right, they call you a country. Like Otis Redding in that, in that song, would you call me tramp? Well, you country. And I used to get clean back then, put the tip on you, Troy Chip, man. <laughs> <laughs> got that crease going in you, you know what I mean? Not like they do today, they do me. That's why they get caught. Police man, they said, talk two minutes, son. I'm going to break their head. Back in the day, boy, you used to be struck. Cops said, talk two minutes, son, you got to get your gun. <laughs> And as I was saying, the first time I heard him was a song, a lot of you going to laugh at, especially young folks, but it was, it was called Sherry Baby. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It hit all the, all the black charts, too. It wasn't just pop charts. Every brother in, United, in, Can in the United States, WBLK, WCHB, were, were doing Sherry. This white dude from New Jersey had the number one song, even on the black charts. Boy, we're getting down. And I told him about that. I told him about his sound. I told him about his real name, Frankie Castellucchio. I said, man, are you, are you mob or are you FBI? You know more about me than I know about myself. This guy grew up, you wouldn't believe the way he grew up. He grew up in a mob infested New Jersey. Everything owned by the mob. Boxing, music. He paid the mob off to buy his group back. He paid them millions of dollars. He didn't, even know he, was the only, he didn't even know he was owned by the mob until he was 23. Little Frankie Valley. And their only group back in the day, the pop charts that stayed up with the, the Beatles. And frankly, on stage, I liked them better. They had better harmony, and this guy's voice was just, back in the day, he had a great voice. He overcame, he lost his ear. He lost his, about 15 years ago, he lost his hearing. So he became tone deaf, and he had to stop. But he didn't want to stop singing, so he began to search the world for a cure for what his problem was. And he finally found it, and he came back. And he's still singing today. And he was one of my best interviews, but uh, he also has so much dedication and passion for his fans. I wanted to say this guy because these are people that get me. Here's another guy that I want. There he is, Dr. Benjamin Carson. Anybody heard of this guy? He's the first man to separate Siamese twins from the head successfully. He led a 22-hour operation. Uh, his story is great. In grade five, he was voted as the dumbest kid in his class. Am I boring you, dear? <laughs> Okay, I'm running out of time now, I'm sorry. No, 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 oh, sorry. Okay. You already got class. Where are you going? You got class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to talk to you. <laughs> this man was both of the dumbest kid in his class. He grew up in Detroit just down the street from me. When we talk, I, I, I met him five or six times. Nice talk. He's a wonderful, warm man. Can you imagine? He was, he was, it was so bad in grade five, he just gave up, but he had a mother that was his support. So no daddy, his mother was married when she was 13 years old, and she had no education. She was illiterate. You know what she said to him? We're going to stop this mess now. No more TV for you, and he had a brother. His brother, by the way, is an engineer. His mother took charge, like you have to take charge of your lives. His mother said, no more TV until your homework's done. And not just that. She took them to the library, and the truth is, God's truth, she made them read two books a week, and then a book report on Saturday. By the time this kid reads grade six, his grades had went up. He graduated from high school with high honors. He went to university with high honors. He is now the director of, uh, uh, what do you call that, pediatric uh, 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 neurosurgery? At the, at the uh, uh, what is it, the um, John House of yeah. But that's something. We had a 70 member team. 22, can you imagine being I want to be operating on me for 22 hours, man. You get tired. They slip, man, to cut your heart or your, 